And so with us this afternoon now, so often we hear that it's great to have this thought leadership on the stage. It, it's fabulous to hear from these you know, best-selling authors. But every now and then, it's a bit of a challenge because how do I actually do that in my real world of work? And so we're so honored to be able to have three people that are going to share with you some of their journey, some of what they do. Um, they're not necessarily New York Times best-selling authors. Uh, they're not necessarily, you know, keynote speakers. Um, but they are people that are doing exactly what it is that you're doing. And so here today with us, we have from ADP, Russell Wong, who is their CFO. From Dell EMC, we have uh, John Hyde, who is their senior director. And from Electronic Art, we have Natalie Altura, who is a senior director of product development. So please join me in welcoming them to our stage. Thank you. Russell. Natalie and John. Fantastic. Would you like some water? Just to be sure, let's, let's get you some water. My pleasure. And to begin, John, maybe I could start with you. Tell us a little bit about who you are. How did you get to our stage today? And, and what's Dell EMC? East Side's on the plane. There we go. <laughs> Where are you from? Uh, my name is John Hyde. I'm Senior Director of Product Strategy uh, Messaging for Dell EMC and Dell Technologies. I live in Rhode Island. Uh, I work in our Hopkinson, Massachusetts office. And uh, just happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Natalie. Uh, my name is Natalie, and I'm Senior Director of Product Development at EA Sports, uh, based here in Vancouver. Um, I oversee FIFA, UFC, and NHL franchises, and I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> uh, we have our leadership team here with us as well, who are heckling me, or trying to, trying to throw me off my A game, so we'll see how I keep this up. <laughs> You'll stay sharp, I'm confident. Um, so, first of all, I'm very excited to be here, and um, I know every speaker says that, but I, I am very excited to be here, uh, and I mean it. Um, as an accountant, I don't get invited very often to, to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and if you could hear my heart pounding right now, you would know that I am very, very excited. So, I am the uh, CFO of ADP Canada. I uh, have been with this organization for four years. Um, and prior to that, I've held uh, CFO roles at a number of other organizations. Thank you. Well, again, we just are so honored to have you be with us here today and to share your insights, experience, and lessons that you've learned in leadership. So, Russ, maybe I can begin with you. Uh, how do you measure leadership? And are there specific leadership metrics that you use? Um, okay, yeah, thanks for the, the question, Bill. Measuring leadership is, is, is definitely a challenge, and I'm, I'm more interested in, in measuring effective leadership. Maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we do at, at ADP. Um, there's a couple of things. We measure leadership uh, among three different dimensions. So it's not just the people aspect of, of leadership. We have uh, business leadership, market leadership, and then people leadership. So the business leadership is about the financial, delivering financial results, financial acumen, um, the market leadership is about the outside in perspective, um, what does the leader do taking care of the needs of the client, and the people leadership is about communication, you know, development, and, and sort of building relationships. So we have a, that's a, a manager assessment tool that we use to assess our, our leaders, and then, then we get uh, a score back, and then we uh, work on development with with that that leader I think but but I'm also a, a very quantitative person and so I like hard metrics so this gives us qualitative metrics but over the past two years we've been testing and, and developing uh, a thing called the leadership compass which is 12 questions simple survey rating out of five that goes to that leaders direct reports and it gives immediate feedback and then I review it with that leader, and then we pick one thing out of that and, and to work on. And it gets a score, it gets um, where they stand in a percentile relative to the other leaders, and we know it's starting to have an impact, so it's very tough to, to, to manage and, and, and measure how leadership is, is impacting the organization, but over the last two years, what we found is the engagement for those leaders who are using the leadership compass for those who don't um, has a significant difference. It's 
around three points of engagement for those leaders who use it, different, and on the front level, front level associates, it's about five points of uh, engagement difference. So it's very, very exciting from, from our standpoint. Well, so you're seeing significant results, and, and you talked about 12 items that you focus on, but then you laser focus into just the one. Is that you uniquely with your direct reports, or is that how ADP rolls this entire process out? It, it's on an individual basis, so it, it would be based on that leader's results. For example, some of the questions that um, we, we ask in the survey is, um, my manager uh, provides opportunities uh, to help me uh, develop, um, and if that is you know, maybe one of the lowest scores, uh, then that's one that we would focus on. Okay, excellent, thank you, appreciate that. Um, John, what about you and your experience? How do you create a culture of success and happiness in your organization? I, it's kind of strange to me to think of a computer company that's focusing on the happiness of their people. Well, happiness is how you get productivity, right? I mean, we all know that a happy employee is gonna do a better job. Um, they're more likely to be retained long-term. Um, and, and it leads to a better production effort when you start to look at what they're doing. So one of the things we really focus on first is uh, we take NPS scores and we have employee NPS scores that we use throughout our entire company. So all 140,000 plus employees get an ENPS survey that they fill out. It's completely anonymous that is then brought back and looked at and coalesced and then it reports up from frontline management all the way up to the executive level. Mm -hmm. And what it allows us to do is really understand the perspectives of our employees uh, relative to our performance so that we can better grade ourselves, uh, which then allows us to translate uh, very simple things like culture, which never matters in an organization. Um, and it also gives us the ability to create the right working environment. And for me, working environment is the most important thing. Because when I start to look at how people are productive, it's really when you start to set the right examples for them that they start to do the right things. You know, how many of us are guilty of responding to an email at 11 p.m. on a Saturday? Or writing that email, or answering the phone when you're out at dinner with your family. Um, as a manager, my job is to make sure I don't do that so I never set the expectation incorrectly with my employees that that's the right thing to do and that that's the standard. <laughs> One of your employees is applauding here in the corner <laughs> that you don't send those emails. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot here. Uh, however, some people in our audience may not be familiar with the acronym that you've used of NPS. So I'm yeah, very familiar, yeah, but can you help them understand yeah, the just in case? Yeah, the score. So it's, it's a scoring system that's used very often in the customer service space where you actually have uh, a reporting structure that's done by your customers to anonymously score your ability to answer in very key areas how they're doing relative to the industry. And so NPS, again, stands for Net Promoter Score. Um, the methodology behind it, frankly, is the percentage of promoters, which are those people that scored you nine or 10, uh, less the percentage of detractors, those people that scored you six and below. Funny, we often think, oh, I got a six, that's pretty good, I can live with that. No, that's a detractor. Uh, in the calculation, those that score you seven and eight aren't even- Yeah, those are the neutrals, exactly. The neutrals, they're not yep. even considered. And so it is the percentage of promoters less the percentage of detractors that really help you understand. It's hard to get scores. What are, you, what are your people running at? So it's, it's interesting. If you look across the industry, um, I believe an NPS score of in, in the 20s is actually really good. Uh, on average, we're seeing the 40s and 50s. So the, the understanding that we have is, is phenomenal as an 80, per, 80, it's not a percentage, it's an 80 NPS. Uh, however, most people do run around 20. Uh, I'm only being somewhat shamelessly plugging here because you will get an electronic survey from us that will ask a net promoter score. And the more you understand it, the better off uh, we have the opportunity to, to make a difference for you. So thank you for that, John. You had no idea um, that you were planning that. <laughs> Natalie, help me here. Please help me. Um, how do you motivate your people on your team? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's, a different, there's different aspects to it. So I think the first and foremost for me is um, I like to challenge and empower the people on our teams to do their absolute best every single day that they come to work. Um, as I look at you know, our leadership team sitting right in, in front of me, I think uh, we're very fortunate that we have the best, the most passionate um, leaders in the industry working with us. So it's very humbling, mm. uh, but it's also very motivating to come to work and be part of that team with them. Um, and then, you know, as John mentioned about the work environment, that's also really important as well. 
Um, obviously, it's the teams that we work with, but it's also the physical space. So shameless plug, I'm going to just copy you a little bit. Uh, shameless plug for EA here. <laughs> uh, you know, we are in a state-of-the-art facility um, in Burnaby with, you know, indoor basketball court, outside soccer pitch. We're allowed to bring dogs to work if you're a dog lover, which I'm not. Um, <laughs> I see Nick going, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and we get, the, we get the opportunity to work on the coolest products there are. We make video games for a living. We bring joy and happiness to millions and millions of players around the world. Um, and if we can't get motivated by that, um, I don't know what we can then. <laughs> so is fun a, one of your values then as an employee, would you suggest? Definitely. Fun, creativity, passion, all of those are very, very important values for us at EA. Fantastic. Looking forward to seeing and learning more about it. Rask. Can I add something? I think Please. Um, one of the things that, that I've been uh, focused on with, with my teams and, and from a motivation standpoint, I think recognition is, is, is very, very key. Um, and in a lot of my um, town halls, I, I, one of the quotes uh, from uh, Dr. Bob Nelson, you know, when you're serious about performance, you need to be serious about recognition. And in, um, in a number of organizations, the recognition tends to just be a duty that is put on the manager. I expect the manager to recognize the, the employee. Um, but what we try to do is, it's me as a, as a leader, I don't know all the amazing things that the associates are, are, are doing. And so if you can give them uh, a way to recognize each other, then that's, I, we find that's a great way to, uh, to, to motivate the, uh, the associates. Amazing. And so I'm, I'm picking up on some language here, though, Russ. You're referring to people as associates and not employees? Yeah, that's uh, actually an ADP um, uh, terminology, and it's, 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 it's a conscious decision. Um, and so associates uh, more denotes, you know, partnership, uh, collaboration, and family. Okay. John, you're nodding your head there. Sounds like something's going. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you look at a lot of the things that are going on in the industry, the technical industry today around things like um, you think here to the term DevOps or developer operations, there's this idea that you could, should never talk, talk about someone that works for you as an employee. They're a team member. They're a person. They're, you, you need to recognize that they are people. You know, it doesn't matter what role they're in. They're a person. They deserve the same respect as everybody else. And we have to be cognizant of that. It's very easy to make somebody a number. Mm. And that's the worst thing that we can do because if you think they are, then they feel like they are. It, it's interesting. In our people leadership program, we challenge people. We challenge all leaders, uh, not managers, but we challenge leaders to eliminate the word thank you from their vocabulary. And when you think about that from a recognition perspective, it's like, what are you guys up to? Why would you challenge us to eliminate the word thank you from our vocabulary? You can buy a freaking card that has thank you in 13 languages on it with glitter and all kinds of amazing things. Maybe it's an electronic card that you're sending to somebody, but it says thank you. And it's a complete thought. It ends there with thanks, whoever you are, for whatever you do. And so we challenge leaders to eliminate the word thank you from your vocabulary, but replace it with I appreciate. And I appreciate is not a complete thought. And so what is it that you appreciate? And that's for us where the recognition really begins, because now it requires that specificity. I appreciate your teamwork. I appreciate, heck, if it's punctuality. I appreciate your productivity. I appreciate your attention to detail. So, you know, we challenge people to think about it from that way, from a recognition perspective. Um, but, but Russ, no one succeeds without that successful team. And so how do you take a good team and make it great? Um, there's a number of things that, you know, getting a team to perform at a really, really high level. Um, I'll, maybe I'll cut, touch on a couple things that I think have worked well for me in, in the past. Um, number one is, is setting high expectations. So I meet with every associate who joins the finance organization, and I tell them I demand high expectations. You work in this organization, um, that's what we're going to be focused on. Because um, I feel if, if you set a, a, a good goal, you'll, you'll get good results. If you, if you set a, a really challenging goal or a great goal, um, you may actually get those great results. And we may not have a way of figuring out how to get there, but that's what 
I want my team to work with me to figure out how we are going to get there. So we'll set goals where we don't have an idea on how to get it, but it fosters that idea of, okay, we've, we've got a gap, how are we going to do this? Here's some innovative ideas, and it kind of sparks some of those things. So that's, that's probably number one. Number, number two, I would say, is high expectations are one thing, but then you've got to be crystal clear on the goals. So I don't think that's you know, anything new that anyone understands that they don't have to have clear and crystal goals, but the fewer the better. Um, we all work on a gazillion things, and I make sure that our finance organization is focused on three. These are the three critical, critical things that we have to deliver this year. You're going to have to do a lot of other things, but at the end of the day, these are the three that are critical to our business. And making sure that everyone understands that um, I think is very, very important. And then the final thing that maybe I'll just mention, and actually Vince talked about this in his, his talk, which I thought was really appropriate, is, is trust. Mm. Um, the difference between a good team, and, and he, he talked about it being, being really tight, um, you've got my back. Um, the difficult part is how do you get that trust in, in the organization? Um, and there's a number of ways of, for me, I, I manage by exception, which means that I trust you, the associate, that you're gonna deliver on your responsibilities unless you tell me otherwise. Mm. And in order for my leadership style to work, you have to have transparent communication. Uh, otherwise, if they don't feel comfortable raising the, the hand and saying, hey, we got an issue here, uh, then obviously that leadership style won't, won't work. Um, and then the other way that I've found for building trust is it really is all about the team and it's not about the individual or, or not about myself. Um, you know, Recently, I had a, 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 my one-on-one -on -one with my VP of FP&A, and we were talking about, you know, what can we do, you know, how's the team working, what can we do to improve performance, is there anything that I can do to support you to, to, to help uh, further? And uh, she actually said, J Russ, just keep doing what you're doing. And, and I said, well, what do you mean? Uh, and she said, well, you remember, remember last Friday when we were working on the close, it was around 10 o'clock at night, and you were here with us, right? And you, you offered to get us food, to go out and get it and bring it back, and you know, she said, hey, that, that was great. We, we really appreciate it. You're, you're here with us. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, you reduced my contribution down to like a delivery person, right? <laughs> Just bringing food back. But it was about, they know that I'm never gonna ask them to do something I wouldn't do, that I'm there with them, I'm supporting them, and I really feel they have my back and they know I've got theirs. Sounds like a new form of servant leadership, Russ. <laughs> yeah, See. a bit of a challenge. Uh, but it is interesting as well because when you're talking about those expectations, when Vince, I think, was talking about those expectations, uh, I think that also distinguishes a manager from a leader as well. And so, you know, in, in our world, a manager doesn't know what they want until they get what they don't want. But even then, they still don't know what they want, they just know they don't want that. Um, you know, and, and so you experience this every night when you go home for dinner, right? It's like, sweetie, what do you want for dinner tonight? Oh, whatever you want, honey. Okay, let's order pizza. Like, oh, I had pizza for lunch. Okay, what about Thai food? Mm, I had Thai food last week. And so, you know, but leaders are really abundantly clear around what does good performance look like. And when we can be that, you know, absolutely clear around what good performance looks like, that's gonna build the trust. That's our hope. And, and so, John, having worked with, with many customers trying to create change and transformation, if you will, what's the organizational challenge that you see most often? Yeah, so, so it's a great question. Uh, I, I spent a lot of my career being a consultant, going out and working with different customers on different transformational opportunities. And the one constant that I always see has nothing to do with technology. It's the status quo. It's the, this is how we've always done it great, we're changing, hence the term change in the, in the project, so let's focus on that part. And that becomes very difficult because that is often a defensive conversation that we have to have. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for people to look at change and not associate that to a fear of some sort, fear of losing their job, fear of change of responsibility, um, fear of becoming irrelevant. Uh, and, and fears are hard to get over, and it's, it's a very base instinct, but we have to work together to really drive out those types of fears and, and look at change as an opportunity, which is what change really can be. I mean, I, I'm part of one of the biggest change opportunities in the tech industry history. If you looked at the Dell EMC merger, uh, we took two massive companies and slammed them together. And I can tell you the overwhelming response from 
a lot of the people and the companies was, what are we doing? We have no idea what's gonna happen here. And there was a great deal of fear in different pockets of the business. And I said, guys, I, I gotta be honest, this is the biggest opportunity that you're ever going to see. It's all in your perspective, but it's all in your willingness to take risk. Mm -hmm. Because risk is where you grow, risk is where you get reward, and risk is where the business gains value as well. So that's really the biggest piece for me, getting people to understand that change is risky, but risk is good. Risk is good? Very good. I will never ever penalize somebody in my team that takes a risk, no matter what. I don't care if they fail. I don't care if they go and do the same project three times. If they fail in different spots of the project three times, great, they learn something every time. The only time they'll get penalized is if they fail in the same spot every time and don't learn from it. Okay. And then it's more of a don't do that again. So what I'm hearing you tell me then, if I was one of your employees, is that I don't fail. One of my team members. Yeah, one of your team members. Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Maybe I'm an associate. That would be good too. Um, but I'm not an employee. Uh, however, uh, I don't fail, I learn. Absolutely. When no, you, you can't fail. I don't, we, we call failure fun. Um, that means you're doing something different. If you're just set, sitting in a box doing your own thing and not taking risks, that, that's very safe. And, and safe is comfortable as an individual, but as an organization that becomes challenging because stagnation happens very quickly. And so Natalie, you're in a different culture than many of us. And so what are some of the unique leadership challenges that you have faced working at EA? Um, I think, you know, it's very similar to what both uh, Russell and John just talked about. But if I were to pick another one that's maybe more specific um, to our industry is at EA, we have such diverse and such large teams, very global teams as well, but uh, we have such diverse teams in terms of we have engineers who have you know very different characteristics. Uh, we have artists, we have animators, we have creatives, we have finance, HR. We have so many different functions in the team. And how do we um, how do we lead through that? How do we flex our leadership style? How do we adapt to that as well um, and still make it meaningful to everyone on the team? So, so how do you attract those people then, because those are very you know, desperate sort of environments, to one EA culture? Yeah. Uh, so it's similar to what you were saying as well. Um, you know, we have a very high bar for when we hire people. Uh, we definitely demand that passion and that creativity and that drive for excellence that we look for. Um, you know, I think the fortunate thing for us is we are a very product-focused company. Um, a lot of people out there know what it is that we do and what it is that we bring. Um, and so they have that passion that they want to be part of something big and amazing. Um, and so we're very fortunate that we're able to hire globally. You know, if I look, for example, on our FIFA team uh, that's based in Vancouver, we have 23 unique languages being spoken um, on the development team. Uh, we hire from all over the globe the best of the best. Um, and we bring them together to make the best games that we can and the best experiences that we can provide. So when I think about gaming, when I think about your product, it immediately takes me to competition. I'm gonna be competitive, I wanna win this game. So are your people competitive? I'd be lying if I said we're not. <laughs> we're definitely competitive, but you know, we're competitive, but we're also a team. And I think, you know, if you ask any of the guys here from our leadership team, and we have some other EA folks here in the audience as well, um, there's strong camaraderie amongst ourselves. Uh, we know that we need each other. We know that we need our expertise from each one of our different areas. We can't succeed alone. We're definitely a team. Um, we're competitive to be the best, but we're not competitive against each other. We're not competitive against internally. Um, if anything, we try to break down those silos as much as possible, and we try to bring teamwork into everything that we do. So when you asked me earlier about, you know, is play um, of important value for us, teamwork is a very much an important value for us as well. Excellent. And, and so speaking of teamwork, speaking of competition, Russ, you've been a CFO at a number of organizations. You mentioned that in your introduction. Um, but you've also held roles outside of finance, and most recently you were the interim president of ADP Canada. How did you make the switch? How did you make the switch back? <laughs> and, and what advice can you give to people who are looking to advance their uh, careers and contribute outside their area of technical expertise? Yeah, I, I think um, 
So first of all, I've probably I've been fortunate. So part of it is being at the right place at the right time, but uh, you know, aside from that, it is it is one of the t I think a tough challenge to move outside your functional area, your area of, of technical expertise. Um, and it's some people see it as a little bit of a catch-22. Hey, in order for me to get that role, I need to have the experience, but I can't get that. You know, I, I can't. I don't have that experience until I get that role. Um, and so. One of the ways that I've, I've found uh, to broaden um, my contributions outside of the functional area is to really uh, get to know the business. Um, with every finance associate I meet, I say, a good financial analyst understands the numbers. A great financial analyst understands the business. Mm. And trying to let everyone know that you need to understand the business. It's great that you can be technical and you know you can be a wizard on Excel uh, and the macros and business case analysis, but you really have to understand not just the key assumptions, but how it relates to the rest of the business, maybe some of the interactions um, and the impact on the processes, uh, the people as, as well. And so what I've done throughout my career is I go on sales calls. I help close deals. I ride along in the trucks to understand really what's happening at a business level um, because that makes you just a, a better finance person in my case, um, but that applies to any role uh, and I truly believe that. So that's how I sort of got uh, the opportunity to become the interim president of uh, ADP and did that for, for six months. Um, and then you ask the question, okay, so and then how do you move back? Um, uh, because I didn't get the job. <laughs> so, but uh, Ouch. There's, a, there's a good lesson in, in, in there. But sometimes the silver medal is actually you know, the same as gold. I, I will say it that way. It was a, a tremendously positive experience. And as I think Tasha talked about, you know, having, uh, getting critical feedback or that, you know, having that, that loving sort of feedback. Um, I grew as a result of that, and I'm in uh, just an amazing place uh, where I've learned so much going through that experience, and that's helped me grow both as an individual and I think my leadership as well. Well, wonderful. I mean, uh, Larry Bossidy and Ram Sharan in their book, uh, Execution, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the fact that it, when we become senior leaders, we technically should be able to lead almost any function with the exception of finance, uh, because if we don't do finance well, you may end up spending your weekends in a lovely or country maybe, club. Or maybe legal. Y legal, yeah, that, that may be a problem as well. <laughs> John. Yeah, I, I just want to add on, Russ, I agree 100%. I think that having the broad perspective of the business is key. I, I think when you get to a certain level of leadership, if you don't understand all aspects of the business, at least to, at least to a certain extent, um, you do a disservice to the role that you're trying to fulfill. Um, and, and more importantly, the, the teams that you work with rely on you to be able to have that perspective because if they don't have the time and they don't have the opportunity to go find those things out, but they are relevant, you need to make sure that that perspective is there for them. Mm -hmm. And so Natalie then, you know, how are games maybe different than other industries? Clearly you've got some other technology here and we've got some finance here and uh, money movement, if you will, and FI. Um, how is games different in terms of how you work and lead? Good question, Bill. <laughs> um, you know, as I listened to again to both Russ and John uh, describe their experiences, um, and you know, even earlier on when you were talking about key metrics and monitoring those around performance, obviously we as a company have that as well. Um, but I think what really separates EA from maybe the rest um, is, you know, the fact that we make video games and video game experiences, um, and inherently those need to be fun. And how do you measure that? How do you actually quantify what fun is? How do you make sure that it is fun? How do you define that? Um, it's such an ambiguous thing uh, mm -hmm. to define. It's not as clear cut. Um, so I think that's a very unique challenge to us in our industry is defining and quantifying that fun and then also ensuring that you know, we're able to iterate on that to make sure that we're at that ultimate fun level <laughs> um, and make the best possible experience that we can. So I'm guessing the final metric on measuring fun is sales. How many people are buying your games? Well, there's a few key metrics. And uh, you know, since you mentioned NPS earlier, I saw everyone in the role right here uh, giggle a little bit, because obviously NPS is a very important metric for us as well. Sales, yes, definitely. 
um, you know, just like in inter in the entertainment business of movies, um, video games are also measured by Metacritic as well. So that's another key indicator for our success. Um, so it depends uh, what it is that you're looking for, but it's a combination of a number of factors. I, I mean, gaming is really quite changed, you know, from a couple of people playing some games down in their basement, we're now playing them in large theaters and it's becoming quite competitive. So what's the evolution? I'm probably not the best person to talk about the evolution of gaming, being that I'm a project manager, I'm not the creative person. Um, but, you know, to your point, gaming has changed dramatically. I've been at EA for almost 15 years right now. Um, and, you know, I remember when we used to make games, we would make games, we would put them in a box, we would ship that box and we'd be done. And then we'd start over again and make the best new game that we can again. Uh, right now, that's very much changed. It's very different where we put out that game, but we also provide a service. So our games are live 365 days of the year, 24-7, um, and we need to make sure that we provide fresh um, and interesting and engaging content for all of our players because that's also a metric that we use for our success. Not only is it the sales, but also engagement of our players and um, users. Um, so that's very much shifted how we work and how we operate as a business, where you know the development cycle that we used to go through has, has needed to be adapted to uh, the evergreen process of supporting a live business. Wonderful. And so when you say that evergreen process, for those that aren't in understanding that term, tell, tell us a little bit more around the evergreen. Okay. Um, what I meant by that is, you know, continuing to foster that process without it stopping uh, and starting fresh. But we also need, so as I said, we need to provide literally 24-7, 365 days a year, we need to provide that fresh content and always be on our A game. Whereas, you know, maybe we can take a step back, rethink um, and replan. We always have to be very reactive and proactive in all our planning. So even after that continuous improvement, yay, the cycle begins again. Exactly. And we've got to keep it alive. Exactly. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Russ, uh, what's one of the things that you did early in your career that was critical to getting you to where you are today? Um, what's really your secret to success? Um, I don't know if there's one, one thing. If, if I had to give some advice to uh, you know, a person who's just starting out in, in their career, um, one of the things that I did, and, and people call it now just curiosity, I, I don't know if that was really what I was thinking at, at, at the time when I was uh, just starting my career, but I would uh, obviously focus on my role and make sure I did that the best that I could, but I always tried to make sure that I had time left over to go and explore other areas, and I would then offer my help in other areas where I had no experience, but I just thought that was really interesting. So I was a financial analyst starting out and I was in inventory. And so I would make sure I got all my work done. And, and then I would go out and I said, hey, how does that process work? Or hey, there's some systems things over here. And I was just really curious about how the organization worked. And then I asked, can I help here? Can I learn? And the answer was, yeah, absolutely, go ahead. Um, and, and so I think I never accepted that I would just stay in my role. I always wanted to understand and look at different opportunities. Um, and so that's a little bit how I started to, to grow. And then people, you start to pick up skills and then people start coming to you and say, oh, you learned that system. Can I get a report out of that? And then it would just start to, to grow from there. And I think uh, as you started to acquire these skills, you become more and more valuable. Um, again, you start to understand the business and that then leads to uh, you know, visibility and much better things. So that curiosity is really something that's driven for you to dig into the business to learn more, to make a difference in your contribution. Yeah, I think for me, I don't know if it was a conscious decision I, I need to learn the business. I, when I look back on it now, I, I kind of see a little bit about what I've done as I, as I reflect. Um, for me, it was, I was just trying to learn as much as I could. I, I found it very interesting um, and I wanted to just keep learning and expanding my, my knowledge. And I, and I wasn't very disciplined about it. It, it wasn't, I had a, a clear cut path. And if you, 
you know, the advice that I get now from, from some of the coaching that I've gotten is you need to be laser focused on your career because, and, and go to your, 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 your boss and, and say, this is what I want and, and what do I need to do to get there? And, and I understand that, but I've also, earlier on, I took a, a different, it was kind of the shotgun approach and it was just like, oh, this looks interesting and, and I'll do that and it just kind of grew from there. Fantastic. John. What's the one thing that you think can make a difference that everyone here can take back to their organization? Talk to people. <laughs> Seriously. Communication is key. I don't know how many of you are involved in cross-organization types of projects or initiatives, especially when you look at things like change. Uh, you can never over-communicate, and you can never be overly inclusive. Uh, if you don't think you have everybody at the table, you probably aren't doing it right. You need to get everybody to the table early on to have these conversations, help identify problems and roadblocks and challenges, and, and let people be part of the solution instead of raising it as a problem later on. If there, you, what I've found is if you have people at the table and they're actively participating in the event or the, the set of projects, uh, they're far more accepting and supportive of it and they're far less resistant to it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I, I totally agree. And, and I would say, uh, in, in my experience, face-to-face -face communication. Um, and that seems funny coming from the, the CFO who's like, no travel, you know, cut down on the discretionary expenses. But um, I actually see the value in the face-to-face -face when appropriate. Um, but <laughs> I, to I totally agree, yeah. And in your fun environment, how much face-to-face -face happens on the basketball court inside, on the soccer pitch outside? Face-to-face um, -face is critical at EA? Um, I would have to agree, if, absolutely. Face-to-face -face is critical, and you know we are um, also a global company that we have t teams all over the world. We try to do you know, VidCon if we can't do face-to-face -face in person. Um, even that is a better step than going over email, or even over the phone, only over the phone. Um, but yes, I 100% agree. Wow. Well, you're clearly courageous leaders. Um, this is not your everyday, sitting in front of 1,500 people, answering some questions that you know, we sort of discussed before we came here. I'm wondering if you're willing to dial up the courage just a little bit. I think it might be time for me to come out into the audience and find out what questions they have for you, but I have absolutely no control over the questions they're gonna ask you. Are you comfortable and ready to give this a shot? Absolutely. All right, the lights are coming up. I'm coming out into the audience. Let's take a look. What would you like to know from our panel? Where am I going? Who's got a hand? Ah, thank you. Hello, I just wanted to ask, in your development of leadership skills, did you find that it was sort of a gradual process which was kind of quite linear, or did you find that there were sort of jumps in your uh, development and understanding of how to be a good leader? Uh, I'll start. Um, it, it was a shotgun for me because I went from an individual contributor to a director in one day and inherited 27 people in no time, so I had to learn really, really quickly. Um, from that point on, it became much more tactical on how I grew my skill set. Um, but it was pretty apparent to me um, where I was screwing up pretty early and was able to rectify that hopefully pretty quickly to my uh, team's happiness. I think for me as well, it was more, shot, uh, more shotgun as well, where um, I just kind of dove in and then tried to figure out how to be the best that I can be. And for me, I find it's still a continuous process as well where I still look for that feedback and I want that feedback so I can keep uh, learning and growing and getting even better. Yeah, the same. It, it was not a linear sort of progression uh, where it was here, my leadership grew here, here. Um, there were definitely setbacks, made lots of mistakes, um, but had the fortune of getting training, talking to a number of people, um, and, and it's really important to find a mentor. So one of the things I would suggest, if you don't have one, just ask. Um, it's, it's amazing. There, every person that I've asked to be a mentor has said yes. Um, and I think people just think that people are too busy, that they, they, they won't want to do it. Um, and if you get a mentor, that will definitely help from a leadership perspective. Um, and I would encourage you to do that if you don't have one already. Yeah, and the one thing I'll add to that is, uh, I agree, a mentor is a, ma a great thing to have, and I, I strongly support that. Um, 
And when you're in doubt, ask yourself if that's how you want to be managed. You know, think about yourself first, and if that makes you happy or sad, you'll know the decision most times. Panel to your far right. You guys talked about, sorry about that, you guys talked about mentorship, but do you define the difference between mentorship and coaching? And which one do you guys find is more effective within your organization? So coaching is more tactical, in my opinion. I think that you coach to correct specific things. I think mentorship is much more strategic where you're really trying to help somebody grow in their professional and personal areas uh, in much longer term goals. I'm not, I'm not sure I make a distinction, honestly, between coaching or, or mentoring. I've had um, the fortune of having a professional coach who's helped me in my career. I've had mentors um, who have been both in and outside the organizations. And, and I, they're, they're trying to do a similar thing. They're trying to help you become better. Um, if there's a particular goal, how you develop, how do you grow. Um, so for me, I don't really make a distinction between mentoring or, or coaching. It's just someone who is trying to help you become better and address a particular you know, skill that you want to be better at or a particular goal that you want to achieve. Panel to your far left. Hi, I'm just curious which one of your companies, if not all three, use managed services in, uh, in other countries and how you actually integrate them from an employee engagement perspective. And you talk about uh, treating them as colleagues and staff. It's, they're not a number. And it, that's a hard thing sometimes from a contractual perspective. What challenges have you guys faced and how have you gotten through that with them? So um, we at ADP do have, uh, we're a global organization and so we are supported from a couple of global shared centers of excellence which are uh, located around the world. And that's a great question. It absolutely is, is a challenge. Um, one of the things that we've learned is as much as you can communicate uh, through phone, conference calls, town halls, that still isn't enough. Um, and go back to my face-to-face, -face, you have to be able, they have to be able to understand uh, the business as much as possible. And so we have a regular process where we actually send people over to these um, different shared service centers which are located around the world to make sure that we try to make sure they understand the business, make those connections for the people who are working together. Um, so we found that has made a, a very, very big difference um, in the support. It's also, whether it's we're in the outsourcing business, and I will tell you, if you just take an internal process that is not working well, and you outsource that, and you use a managed service, it's not gonna be any better. In fact, it's gonna be worse. So you have to, not only just from a communication standpoint, but the process and the underlying processes themselves, um, you gotta work on that and make sure that that works as well. Um, I completely agree with uh, Russell, and if I was to add, uh, the only thing I would add is we also make sure, you know, not only do they understand the business, they also understand the goal, and they understand how they are a part of that end goal as well. Uh, we also encourage very much to give them a piece of ownership of, you know, if it's a product, that they're not just an outsource server, uh, outsource provider that we just throw work over the wall, but we really want them to be part of the process with us. And the best way for us to encourage that is to give them a sense of ownership um, and make them feel part of the team. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that what they've said is absolutely spot on. I think um, making sure they have ownership and that they have uh, a vested feeling that they're part of the team is the biggest piece there. And, and you know, face-to-face, -face, as Russ said, is super important there. You know, different levels of communication evoke different levels of emotion within the people that you're working with. So, you know, text being the most impersonal thing ever, email not far behind. Phone gets better, you know, can start to hear somebody's inflections. Um, you can't replace that ability to read somebody's face and body language and really interact and shake their hand. You know, that is it. When it becomes a personal connection, you get a much different response. And I'd also say that um, accountability is, is really, really important. So you talked about the, the, the ownership. I think some of the challenges earlier on in, in when we did, I've done both offshoring and outsourcing, and they're slightly different. Um, 
but a lot of times the organization that is is giving up the the process or that service and is outsourced or offshored um, then they kind of abdicate responsibility sometimes and so the accountability is absolutely still with that organization and making sure that your leaders understand that it's it's you are still responsible, but it's just being serviced at an, uh, another area. I think that is very, very important. Panel just to your right here. Hi there. I want to bring it back to the employee net promoter score. Um, Natalie and John, you both mentioned that your companies are using it. Um, when you first implemented it, did you get any pushback or misgivings from the leaders that were going to now have this new accountability measure? And if so, how did you get their buy-on or um, mitigate the impact of that? Yeah, so for us it was, um, well, for me specifically, it was an, an existing process that already came, was in existence with Dell when I came on board from, from EMC. Um, and I'll tell you, having talked to many leaders in the, the heritage EMC business moving into this new model, they were happy about it because it gave us honest opinion. You know, the most difficult thing that we had was the ability to judge the honesty of the feedback that we were getting from people in the team. Um, because if it's not anonymous and it's not normalized and there's not a standardized set of questions that are being asked that are gonna get the right answers, uh, results will vary at the very least. Uh, or you get wildly inaccurate responses. So th the, the ability to get that kind of a mechanism where we can rely on the feedback was super valuable for us. So in our case, actually, the NPS that we use is more for our services and our products that we provide. We haven't used NPS for our employee experience, but you know that's why we're here, here to learn. So I think it's a great idea, and it's something that we're going to take away and take a look at if we can implement that for employee experience as well. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak to us. This has been really enlightening. Um, you know, you've all had what seems to be really, really fantastic careers. And throughout those careers, you've most likely gone from having a peer to then being um, their boss. So I'm just wondering, through that transition, how did you preserve the relationship that you value so much? And how did you modify it or tweak it? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, and it comes up quite often. I actually, um, interestingly enough, I pro approach it a little bit differently. So um, I do have people in the organization that I manage um, that are my friends, and they were my friends before I became their manager, uh, but I get rid of those terms. So I, I have somebody on my team who we go to major conferences or to an event, and he introduces me as his boss, and I smack him in the shoulder and say, I'm your teammate, I'm not your boss. Um, we're all in this together, and getting that idea really does start to change the dynamic of how that works. Now, there do come times when you do have to take on a more managerial role and have that player-coach type of a conversation where it can be sometimes difficult, um, but we do it more in a, in a social setting than in a formalized setting, and it tends to make that a little bit simpler for us. Um, that's my personal style and how that's worked and, and worked well for me, uh, and, and I've I've gone back to my friends uh, who I, I actually believe everybody on my team and, and I are friends, which is a nice feeling. Uh, but I'll ask them, like, does this work for you? Do you, do you un understand the role differences? A and is this valuable to you? Does it make sense? And are you comfortable with it? And everybody has said yes, it, it works for them because they understand you know, when we're being friends and when we need to be colleagues. I'll be honest, I think it's a tough one. I think it's a tough one to find that right balance between being someone's you know, manager or boss, as you said, um, and being someone's friend. Um, you know, I alluded to it earlier. Um, I do strongly believe in that sense of the team, um, and I feel that I'm just a part of that team, to your comment as well. Um, but it's definitely, a, you know, I don't really have a good answer for that one <laughs> as I sit here and think about it. Uh, I think it is something that I'm aware of, and. Um, I struggle with it sometimes as well, but uh, I try to find that balance as I go through my career. I think for me it's, it's easy because I don't have any friends, so. <laughs> <laughs> but. It's because you won't let them travel. <laughs> 
let's have an honest conversation. Um, I, my, my leadership style is very, very collaborative, actually. And uh, so, again, everything I talked about in transparency and communication, you have a, I have a conversation with people say, okay, you know, I used to be your peer. Um, now I'm in a leadership role. Let's talk about what that means. Um, I, you know, again, back to John, we're a team. This is all about us, you know, being successful together and I need your support and I will do whatever I can to support you. So there will be some changes, but we'll figure it out as we, we go together. And panel, here's your last question from the audience. Uh, you spoke about mentorship a bit, but is there anything that you can share with us that you actively do to become better leaders yourself? Um, so there's, there's a couple of things um, that I've recently undertaken. Um, even though I've been in leadership roles uh, in a number of different organizations, uh, I mentioned that I actually got a, uh, a, 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 an executive coach. And so that, I, I, um, it was presented to me, and at first I thought, well, that's kind of a negative thing. I need a, a coach to help me with my you know, leadership. Uh, but... Then I thought about it, I was like, this is a fantastic opportunity uh, to really help me understand better what people think, where I can truly Im uh, improve. And so for me, actively improving my leadership, uh, that was, if you have that opportunity, it's been, uh, I've had a very, very uh, you know, fantastic, uh, uh, I think, uh, result as, 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 uh, as going through that process. So similar to Russell, um, you know, I'm also going through a uh, process with a coach as well, and I'm finding that very useful and helpful for me to keep growing. Um, but I think it's also just not stopping at learning. Um, I think it's always looking at yourself, trying to be, you know, I thought I was self-aware until I listened to the talk earlier, so I'm not <laughs> quite sure if I'm self-aware as, as much as I thought I was. Um, but it's, you know, gaining that self-awareness either through feedback or any other ways and you know, pushing yourself to improve and get better with every day, um, and not be complacent. So not you know, not settle and uh, just challenge yourself. Yeah, yeah, similar. And I, I agree with both the statements that Russ and Natalie have made. I think what I would add to it is um, never stop being uh, improving yourself as a person. I think that personal growth will help you become more aware of who you are and how other people perceive you because. Perception of your teammates is really how you're going to understand where you can be more effective and where you can spend some time getting a mentor and or a coach. Um, and there's, both, there's many aspects to coaching, and it could be something that seems somewhat outside of bounds, and maybe you need to go to, uh, and work with a coach on how to present effectively to large audiences, or um, perhaps it's how to give better reviews to your employees or whatever the case may be. There's a lot of different ways that you can approach that, but. Um, it's all about personal growth for me, and I think about what I want to do next, not just as you know, uh, somebody who's a leader, um, but what's my next role going to require of me that I don't know yet? So quite a powerful question from our audience. Thank you so much. I just want to respect and appreciate your leadership courage, uh, and at times as well, your self-deprecation. So thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panel.